Now, we've just gotten underway in our, in our study, and you'll recall from last week, just a quick, er, there's the map, you'll recall from last week that Romans was written from Corinth, uh, probably around A.D. 57, that seems to be a really good estimate, from Corinth, and it's near the end of Paul's third missionary journey. And Paul is uh, he's planning to deliver the collection that he has for the saints. He's planning to j- deliver that to Jerusalem. And then after that, his goal is to go to Spain to preach. And he's, going, he's planning to stop off at Rome on the way. And he's hoping that when he does that and heads, o- heads west to Spain, that he can continue with the blessing and the interest and the support of the Christians in Rome to kind of have that as a missionary base to Spain. So Paul is looking, that, that's his intention, his plans, and he lets us know that. Now the church in Rome, as I noted last week, it consists of both Jewish and Gentile Christians. And it seems likely from some things Paul says that the Gentiles were in a substantial majority. And so uh, I mentioned how that could have come about given how a good idea on how the church may have started there. Now, when we ended last week, we were looking at Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. we just kind of gotten started on that. I want to read that again, pick up where we were, and I'll say a little bit more uh, about that. Now, as Scott mentioned to me after the class last week, one could explore almost every phrase of this opening, and in fact, of the whole book of Romans, in more detail. That's true. I mean, there are a lot of things lurking in here that you could bore down and dig into, But my my hope is to strike a balance, and this is always you're doing when you're teaching, is to strike some kind of balance between the level of detail and the pace of the class that will appeal to most of you. Because if we just come in and do a quick overview, people will be going, well, that was worthless. (laughs) And if you dig down too deep on all the details, people will be going, you're killing me, i got to get out. (laughs) So you try to find that balance. Now, where I draw that line is, of course, influenced by the questions that I consider more interesting or significant, and that's because I'm teaching. (laughs) So the things that strike me, I will dig into in more detail, sometimes more than you'd care to have me do that. And certainly much more uh, can be said on the book of Romans than I'm going to say in, uh, I'm guessing, two quarters. That's about as quickly as I think I can get through it. All right, let's read chapter 1, verses 1 to 7 again. Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, and I said last week, I'm just picturing being this group of Christians, listening to this letter that's being read from the apostle. And here we are in Rome, A.D. 57. Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, having been set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who came from the seed of David according to the flesh, who was appointed Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness from the resurrection of the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Him we received grace and apostleship for bringing about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of His name, among whom you also are, those called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all the beloved of God who are in Rome, Those called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said last week, there's a parallel structure in verses 3 and 4, at least it seems that way, that leads a lot of people to believe that Paul is here alluding to, citing, quoting an early Christian creed. You know, they had creeds that they set up, which were just summary statements of faith that you could say to people and you could remember these things. So many think that this is one of those, and this is he's fleshing out the gospel that he mentioned in uh, verse 2, and you can see the parallel structure concerning his son, Jesus our Lord, who came from according, who was according from. And so that kind of structure leads some people to think, okay, he's drawing on something that existed out there. And right when we ended, I, I pointed that out, and then right when we ended, I was talking about the significance of the assertion that the Son came into human existence in the lineage of David. Now, that's a clear reference to the fact Jesus is the Messiah. You see, that, you hear that lineage of David talk, seed of David. 
That's a way of saying that he is the long-awaited Messiah. The promise to David that his seed would have eternal reign that you see in 2 Samuel chapter 7, especially in verses 12 through 16, that became the prime focus of messianic expectation in the Old Testament. That promise that the seed of David would have eternal reign, that became the main focus of messianic expectation in the Old Testament. Here are some texts that I pulled out that, uh, that make that connection of the descendant of David, that he's the Messiah. And this is also true. It was the prime focus of messianic expectation, not simply in the Old Testament, but in Judaism. And you can see it, for example, in the New Testament. You see in this text in John chapter 7, verses 41 to 42, it says, others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the Scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David? You see, this was understood. This is people talking and they're saying, no, no. We all know that the Scripture says that the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, He will be a descendant of David. So when Paul is talking about this, that's what you're hearing. That Jesus is, in fact, the long-awaited Messiah. And you see that in Judaism. You see in Matthew 9, 27, the blind men, they call Jesus, what? Son of David. Son of David. And that Jesus was the fulfillment of this promise, that's all over the New Testament. That he was the fulfillment of this promise, the, the descendant of David, the anointed one, the Messiah. You can see, for example, in the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. Verses 1 to 16, you see it in Luke chapter 1, verse 27, verse 32, verse 69, 2 Timothy 2, 8, Revelation 5, 5, Revelation 22, 16, all over the New Testament. So when Paul says what he says, when Paul writes this and says this, you know, this is that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. Now, if I can just give you an aside here, the fact that you had periods of time you see, you had periods of time when you had some who were not from David's line who temporarily ruled in Israel. You had Gedaliah who was appointed, and then during the intertestamental time you had people. That's not contrary to the promise that God gave in 2 Samuel 7 and in Psalm 89. Because that promise, he makes clear that it contained a punitive clause. That if David's sons, David's children rebelled against God, they would be punished. And that this punishment could result in a temporary Davidic vacancy. So you don't look and say, well, there was a time when there was no Davidic ruler on the throne. Well, listen, this is part of the promise that if you rebel, that there is a punitive element to be there, that there will be and can be a vacancy, but the right to rule. The dynasty, the right to rule, would always remain in David's line. And so that was understood. And so what are we, we're always waiting for. Who are they waiting for? They're waiting for the descendant of David. Why? Because that's what God had promised, that the seed of David would rule eternally. And so they're waiting for that. Now, the eternal Son of God, the eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ was appointed Son of God in power. I know some translations, they render this that he was declared, you can, and you can do these different ways. That's why I give you this translation, because it shortcuts. You can get right to how I understand it. <laughs> because there are translations, you could say he was declared powerfully Son of God by the resurrection. But I think what it's saying is he was appointed, and that's the very same word that's used for appointed in Acts chapter 10, verse 42, and in Acts chapter 17, verse 31, where he's appointed, Jesus appointed judge of the living and the dead. He's appointed the one who will judge the world. It's the same word. And so I think that, you know, the, the, taking it as declared is not the best way of doing it. He's appointed, and I think he's appointed son of God in power. He's appointed Son of God in power from, 
And you can take from the, the, the preposition there. You can, it normally means from or out of. But you can take it as by. But I think he's saying he's appointed son of God in power from the resurrection. Meaning at the time of or on the basis of the resurrection. So what's, what's the point? In other words, what I think he's saying is that before the resurrection, Jesus was son of God. He is in nature God. But before the resurrection, he was son of God in the weakness and the lowliness of his earthly existence. But from the resurrection, at the time of the resurrection, he was exalted. He was appointed from the resurrection, son of God in power. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, we see there Paul spells out that the son chose to forego certain prerogatives of his divinity in obedience to the will of the Father, only to have bestowed on him, because of his faithfulness, this supremely powerful position of Lord of Lords. Let me read that to you. You're very familiar with it, I know. But he says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, think this, think this way among you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, the nature of God, did not consider being equal with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Now that's an understanding that's reflected in the NIV. Uh, I think that's right. Seems to be the current understanding of that rare word that's used there. Uh, but whether you want to say he didn't consider it something to be grasped or something to be exploited, used for his own advantage, continues in verse 7, says, but emptied himself... By taking the form of a slave, by being born in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, also God highly exalted him and graciously gave to him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend that of the heavenly ones and the earthly ones and the ones under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you see this idea that there's something about at the resurrection there is, a, there is an appointment, there is a change. See with the resurrection Jesus entered a new state or a new stage of his messianic work, of his messianic career. He was exalted to a new position and place. Let me read to you what Ben Witherington, he's a New Testament scholar, this is how he puts it in his commentary on Romans. He says, verse 4 is not about what Christ is according to his divine nature, but rather about what happened to Jesus at the resurrection when God's Spirit raised him from the dead and designated or marked him out as son of God in power. Paul means here that at the resurrection, Jesus enters a phase of his career where he becomes son of God in power. Previously, he was son of God in weakness. He did not assume the role of glorified and exalted and all-powerful Lord until after the resurrection. So also Philippians 2, when he was appointed to such a role. And so that's what I think he's talking about here, that there was something significant in this process of inaugurating the kingdom where Jesus comes, we have the incarnation. He grows up, he teaches, he performs miracles as evidence of the invasion of this kingdom. He's crucified, resurrected, and ascends to heaven. And he is then exalted as king of kings and lord of lords. Overall, he's always God. Always God. But in his messianic role, there is an appointment to a new status or a new stage or a new state of that role, that function, that career that pivots on the resurrection. The resurrection is huge. And so I think that's what he's talking about. He's appointed son of God in power from the resurrection. He's appointed that way that marks some kind of shift in his messianic career. Now then he says here, he's, where is his birth in David's, David's lineage, he says it was according to or in relation to the flesh. His resurrection-based appointment as son of God in power was, it, was in relation to what? The spirit of holiness. So you have his birth as a descendant of David is according to or in relation to the flesh. 
His resurrection-based appointment, Son of God in power, is in relation to the spirit of holiness. And His human birth was in relation to the flesh, and I think not simply in that it involved flesh. It involved, of course it did. It's an incarnation, and He's coming into, into human line as a descendant, a legal descendant of David. But I don't think he's just talking about that, that it simply involved uh, human flesh, but that he came about, his birth as a descendant of David came about in the old order of reality that is passing away, the realm of the flesh. That his, his birth is in this old order. He comes to bring the new order. He is pulling... The not yet into the now. He's pulling the eternal, the heavenly, into the now. And so he's born in the flesh in this state that is destined to pass away, to be replaced. And so he inaugurates the kingdom, he pulls it in, he's born, he launches that. He launches that here in this state or this age that is destined to pass away, this old age, this old order. And so I think it means more than simply he's born physically, although it certainly includes that. And his, his exaltation was, was related to the spirit of holiness in that it was related to this coming of the new order, this, re, this reality that is characterized by complete holiness, absolute purity, God's ultimate purpose. You see, that's the work of the spirit. So this is the idea, I've said this many times, I think it's important, it is to me a significant central idea of New Testament theology, is that you have in Christ the inauguration of the kingdom of God, so that the kingdom of God has already invaded this reality, it has invaded the present, has invaded the now, but now For a while, until he returns to consummate this kingdom, you and I live in this overlap of ages. This is this idea of the now and the not yet. We live in this overlap of ages where the kingdom is a present reality, but what continues is the old order of suffering and death and sorrow and mourning and crying and pain and sin, but a day is coming. A day is coming when he will return to consummate the kingdom that he inaugurated. And at that point, all that is contrary to the eternal vision of God will be stripped out. And the eternal eternal kingdom of God will go on. You see, this is an important thing. It will go on where there will be all the suffering that we see. Gone. Death. Gone. And you see that, that's this idea of the, of the new heavens and the new earth, the new creation. Talked about it in Revelation. I talk about it all the time. <laughs> you see, because I think it's important. And I think you're seeing aspects of this here when he talks about flesh and he talks about the spirit of holiness. And you see this idea, this complete purifying. And so we have with Christ exaltation, we have the inauguration has fully begun. You see, the inauguration of the kingdom is what? It too comes in a span. Because when Jesus says, well, then the kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom comes as Christ ministers, teaches, performs miracles as evidence of the invasion. And then it's fully here, fully inaugurated with his resurrection and ascension. So now what? Now we're in that overlap where the kingdom is here but so is the old order that overlaps. So what do we see? We see in the presence of the kingdom of God, ongoing suffering, death, and all that. That's why in a number of the parables, I taught through the parables, and the notes on that are online. You can go read them if you're inclined to such a thing. But you see many of the parables where Jesus teaches to address this question of if you are ushering in the kingdom of God, We understand the kingdom of God to be the divine utopia, this perfect state when God's will is fully and completely expressed when he no longer allows the rebellion that he has allowed to go on for so long. Now, if you're the one bringing that, as you say, 
then why do we see suffering and death? And he tells parables to tell them that we've often misunderstood in my judgment. He tells them parables to say, listen, the kingdom comes in two stages. There is this initial inauguration, then there is the ultimate consummation. But you can go look at those parables and see. And that not just in parables, but he says that in a lot of places. All right, there was more than I wanted to say about that, but that's how I do <laughs> when I get off on something. All right. Now, Paul and, and anybody similarly situated, he received this special gift of being an apostle for the purpose of bringing about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles. So this is what Paul, he received this special gift of being an apostle. And obedience of faith, it speaks of true conversion to Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. It speaks of conversion to Christ. That shouldn't surprise us. Let me read to you what Douglas Moo says in his commentary. He says, We understand the words obedience and faith to be mutually interpreting. Obedience always involves faith, and faith always involves obedience. They should, should not be equated, compartmentalized, or made into separate stages of the Christian experience. Paul called men and women to a faith that was always inseparable from obedience for the savior in whom we believe is nothing less than our lord and to an obedience that could never be divorced from faith for we can obey jesus as lord only when we've given ourselves to him in faith and this to me is an important thing and it's a, it's something that i harp on quite a bit is the notion of christian faith is not simply mental assent to propositions it was never that. And so we want to sit here and say, no, no, no. Do you think intellectually that these things are true? Okay, you're good. You're good. Let it have no effect on how you live. You live any way you want to. You get stoned all you want to. You sleep with anybody you want to. You talk any way you want to. You do this and do that. Perfectly fine. If I ask you and you say, yes, I believe these things are true, well, you're cool. All right, I'm telling you that's crazy. Absolute, utter nonsense. Biblical faith has always been a surrender to that truth. It is the yes of the entire person. It is not simply the yes of your mind. You surrender and submit to that truth. And so I've said other times, how could you possibly think you can do that? That you can embrace Jesus as Lord and not have it transform your life. We wouldn't think that anywhere. If somebody said, I'm joining the Marines, you'd expect that to have some effect on his life. It's only in Christianity do we sit here and say, no, no, I can, just, I can just say, no, that's right, I'm good. And I'll just ignore him. And that's why when Jesus says in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You see, anybody can say these things. The question is, when you say them, do you mean them? And if you mean them, well then inevitably and invariably, you will live differently. You will live according to the truth that Jesus is Lord. And if the Lord says, I want you to be a certain way, I want you to live this way, I want you to glorify me this way, I want you to be about this, what are you going to do? What do you do if your boss at work tells you to do something? Well, I suspect most of the time you go, okay, yeah, I'm going to do that. Right? Well, that's the idea of Lord. You see, so I mean, this is, uh, you see this, and I think that's tied up in the obedience of faith that he's talking about. I think Moo's right about that. Now, Paul's particular call was to minister to Gentiles in distinction from Jews. You see that in a number of places. You see it in Romans eleven thirteen. 13. Galatians chapter 2, verse 8, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. But this doesn't mean that Paul was to preach exclusively to Gentiles. It just means that Paul was to preach primarily to Gentiles. And you can see that, for example, in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. And this ministering that Paul does, it was done for the sake of his name, meaning it was done for the glory and praise of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's about. 
Why is Paul laboring? Why is Paul getting kicked all over the Mediterranean? Why did Paul forego the privilege of his status as one of these rising intellectuals? That he could have had everybody fawning over him and said, Oh man, that Paul, whoa, Paul. Paul's really a deep thinker. Whoa, Paul, I like Paul. He could have had that. And Paul threw all that away. Why? Because he's serving the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's concerned about. He's concerned about the glory and praise of the Lord Jesus. Now, I believe with many commentators that verse 6 is best punctuated the way I've done it here. Among whom you also are. Those called to belong. Literally, it says those of Jesus Christ. Those called to belong. So he sits here and he says, The obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, among whom you also are. Meaning, You, this predominantly Gentile group in Rome, you also are within the orbit of my responsibility as an apostle to the Gentiles. You see, you are within my orbit because your group is predominantly Gentile, so understand that I'm not encroaching or doing anything. You are in my sphere. I have been called as an apostle to the Gentiles. So he wants to do that, I think, to reinforce his authority with them so they understand, okay, we get it. Now, these predominantly predominantly Gentile, these people, predominantly Gentile group, they've responded to God's call to enter into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, among whom you also are, those called to belong to Jesus Christ. So they have responded, they have said yes, and then Paul describes the Roman Christians as the beloved of God who are in Rome, those called to be saints. God, of course, loves all people. He loves all people. That's a given. His son died for all people. But there is a special sense, he has a special love for those who open their hearts to respond to his call. For example, in John chapter 14, verse 21, Jesus says, One who loves me will be loved by my Father. What are you talking about? I understand. You see, he loves everybody, but there is something about those who embrace his gift that he has a special bond with. And so that's what I think Paul's referring to here when he says that. The beloved of God who who are in Rome, and Christians are, of course, he refers to them as saints. You've heard this many times. They're saints. We are holy ones. We've been set apart in a special relationship with God. And we say that so often. Think about what that means. Just think about what that means. That you and I have been set apart, sanctified in a special relationship with the creator of the universe. Just think. I mean, that ought to be mind-blowing, but we just hear it so many times. Yeah, 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 yeah. I understand, I understand, yeah, okay, saint, saint, set apart, holy, holy, yeah, get it. But pause, and let some of these things that are just, we take as just like throwaway comments, that we understand what's being said here. We've been set apart in this special relationship, we've been separated from what, the dominion of darkness, Paul says in Colossians 1.13? That's pretty significant, isn't it? We've been separated from the dominion of darkness. You see the same idea in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. We've been separated from the present evil age. Well, how's that, how's that working? That's what I'm telling you. There is an overlap. We've been called out of it. But that age is going until the return. Then it's going to be stripped. But we've been called out of this present evil age. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. We've been placed by God's grace within his kingdom. Colossians 1 13 again. We've been placed by God within his family. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, 18 and other places. Just listen to this. And he's saying to these saints in Rome. This is who you are. This is who you are. You say, but I'm not, you know, look, I'm just a dude. (laughs) You know, just the guy fumbling around and messing up and all this stuff. And he says, listen to who you are. You are the call. You're chosen, elect, saints, holy, blessed, special through God's work in Jesus Christ. And if we can absorb that and understand that, 
I think it affects how we live. I think it affects how we live when we see, whoa, look what God has given to us. All right. Chapter 1, verse 8 through 15. He says, first, I give thanks to my God through Jesus Christ concerning all of you, because your faith is being proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve in my spirit and the gospel of his Son, how constantly I make mention of you, always in my prayers, asking if somehow now at last I will be given by God's will an open road to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be strengthened or rather to be encouraged together with you through each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I often purposed to come to you, yet I was hindered up till now, so that I might have some fruit even among you as also among the rest of the Gentiles, to both Greeks and barbarians, to both wise and foolish, I am a debtor. Hence, my eagerness to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome." Now, Paul gives thanks to God for all the Roman Christians, Jews, Gentiles, all the Roman Christians. He's aware of them because their existence was reported in the Christian communities, he says, throughout the world. Now, this is hyperbole. You see, this is hyperbole. This is an exaggeration designed not to deceive anybody. It's designed to emphasize something. It's like when I say the guy hit the ball a mile. Well, what am I saying? Am I saying that? So somebody, he was trying to trick me. He said, no, you get it. I'm saying the dude slammed the ball. And so this is the idea. He says that this has been preached. He's trying to emphasize how widely the news that the church was in Rome had spread. No doubt facilitated by Claudius' expulsion of the Jews in A.D. 49. You remember last week, the rioting at the instigation of Crestus, which most people understand to be Christ. There was rioting of the Jews over disagreement about whether Jesus is the Messiah in Rome in 49, and Claudius expelled everybody. In Acts 18, you see Priscilla and Aquila receive that. And so this idea, see, facilitated, it was so widely known all over that the church of Christ was in the heart of the empire. That the church of Christ was in the city of Rome. That the church of Christ was there and Jesus was acknowledged as Lord even in the great capital city of Rome. That was big news. That was important. That was exciting to the saints. And it's hard for us to grasp that because we don't generally give status to cities. It's like, who would care? City here, city there, but there are such things as significant cities, and maybe we still have some of that when you would say something like New York, L.A., Sean, Frank, you see? What about that? You see, well, there's something about, you know, that's like the big time. Okay, well, we may have some of that, but when you understand Rome, okay, there, this was important and significant. It said something that Christ has acknowledged as Lord in Rome. They saw something in that. Anyway, and it spread in something. So Paul, who wholeheartedly serves God in the preaching of the gospel of Christ, he regularly mentions them in his prayers. You know, he, he doesn't know these folks. I mean, he may know some of them, but he hasn't been there. But he regularly mentions them in his prayers, asking that God will give him an open road to come to them. He longs to see them, he says, that he might impart to them some gift or blessing of the Spirit that would, what, strengthen them. He longs to be there. He prays regularly for God to open a road for him that he can come and be among them rather than by distance, that he can impart to them some gift of blessing of the Spirit Meaning, in my view, he desired to exercise among them some spirit-given insight or ability that was tailored to their specific needs when he was in Rome. I want to visit you and be among you and see you and live with you and work with you so that I can see where the needs are so that I can impart to you 
Spirit-given insight or blessing that will what? Strengthen you in your faith. That's what I want. It's harder when I'm away. I want to be among you so that I can bless you in this way. And I think that's what Paul is referring to there and talking about that. For now he has to be content to bless them from afar through this letter. And Paul also recognized that their faith would be an encouragement. And I love this, the way he, he works this. He says, and for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be strengthened. And he's thinking, I realize that this is going to be a two-way street. You see, if he left that like that, somebody say, ah, what's Paul think he's something? But he says, or rather to be encouraged together with you through each other's faith, both yours and mine. See, Paul knows when he's among brothers and sisters, people who've given their lives to Jesus Christ, it is a tremendous up. You know that, right? I mean, when you're, when you're with, can I say, the real deal? <laughs> is that offensive? When you're with people who you understand, these people love the Lord Jesus and are committed and devoted to him. Well, it's an up. <laughs> it's just wonderful. And on the other side, when you're with people you think they don't really care about Jesus, that this is a social club, that's a bummer. <laughs> so Paul says, look, I understand how this is going to work that we're going to encourage one another. Now, as a footnote, years ago I was struck by the way in which God granted Paul's prayer. Paul has been praying regularly. Okay, he's in A.D. 57, he's in Corinth, he's going to become... Paul's been praying regularly that God will open a door for him to come to them in Rome. And I doubt very seriously that Paul had in mind the way God was going to say yes to that prayer. Paul goes to Jerusalem... You see, and he avoids a plot to kill him. He winds up spending two years in prison in Caesarea. He finally, through his appeal to Caesar, gets sent to Rome and then has a shipwreck. You see, you and I would think, listen, I want to go to Rome. Can you just zap me there? You're God. Can you just transport me? I want to be in Rome, open a portal, bloop, you know, give me a wormhole or whatever it is, and put me on a street. But he doesn't do that. He says, Paul, you're just going to have to trust me. I have other things in mind. So you just go on. You'll be here. You'll be facing all that you face there. You'll spend two years in a jail in Caesarea, and I could just imagine. I wanted to go to Rome. I wanted to preach and teach and help people, and you got me sitting here. He said, just, just, just trust me. <laughs> just trust me. I don't always work the way you think I should. But you're going to have to rely on me. I'm God. Okay, I'm God. And so things happen in life. And we talked about this last Sunday in Esther. You see how God does things and works in ways that you and I don't perceive, don't recognize. And that's what he's doing in Paul's life. So I've always been struck by that from some years ago. It helps me, see, to appreciate how God's working in our lives is beyond my very limited vision. And I need that. I need that because I get frustrated. When I sit here and I say, listen, why? Why? I do these things, I labor, and it looks like it's meaningless. Why? Your responsibility, you be a faithful laborer. Okay? You be a faithful laborer, and you just leave the stuff to me, okay? Trust me, I'm here, I love you, and you just be at your work, and you leave the rest to me. If we can understand that, we can find peace. We can find peace, all right? Now, Paul says he, he feels a... Well, he wanted them to know that he, in, he intended to visit them, but he'd been kept from doing so. He doesn't spell out why, but I think he's probably kept from, by more pressing responsibilities. Paul is preaching the gospel all over the eastern provinces. I mean, what a responsibility. So he's longed to go. It could be something more direct, a more direct satanic intervention. I don't know. But Paul has longed to go there, and he wants them to know that my absence from you is not because I don't want to go. 
I'm not hiding, as I think the next lines suggest either people were thinking or he might have been concerned they were thinking. I'm not hiding at all. I wanted to go there, but I was prevented so far from coming to you. He says he wanted to visit that he might have, what, some fruit among them. Paul wants fruit among those in Rome. And I think he's thinking primarily he wanted to visit that he might convert Gentiles to the faith from within their community. I mean, that to me is what I think of first when I'm thinking about fruit, but it certainly does not exclude the fact that Paul wanted to strengthen those who were already converted to the faith. That's fruit. So Paul wants to be there to what? To reap on God's behalf. He wants to be there that he can convert Gentiles to the faith, that he can use what God has given him to talk to people and to draw them to Christ. And that he can use what God has given him to strengthen their faith so that they'll be holding on. Because you and I know that coming very soon, there's a storm coming in Rome. And you see hints of this, you see it in in Hebrews, you see it in other places. And so Paul is writing, he, he wants to strengthen the brothers and sisters in their faith so that when that storm and persecution and those things hit, that they will hold to Christ like a mad dog. Because that's what we need. Because there are things that try to buffet us and blow us off the mark. And we have to hold him and say, I don't care whatever happens. I'm never going to turn loose of him. How things look, how things appear, what the world tells me, how it may. I'm holding to Jesus Christ. Okay, he's the one who died for me and I trust him. And I did hear that bell. Thank you.